Worf waits for the ecology of District 6 to right itself. Captain Shaw is feeling chipper. And Picard practiced his Bajoran for 30 years. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton. Hello, hello. My name is Ryan T. Husk, and today we're doing a review of Star Trek Picard Season 3, Episode 5, entitled Imposters, written by Cindy Appel and Chris Derrick, directed by Dan Liu. And we've got a very special guest with us right now, director of Episode 5 and 6, Mr. Dan Liu. Hi, everybody. Nice to meet you. Hello, Dan. This is so cool. Let's just get right into this because this is we're loving this season, all of Picard. But this is just intense. It's fun. It's funny. It's cinematic. And you are directing two episodes. First things first, you directed an episode of Strange New Worlds, episode four, I think, Memento Mori, if I remember correctly, the ship in a bottle. Uh, Super you know, a high intensity episode. Do you know, did you get the call to direct Picard because of that? Or were you already kind of? Oh, absolutely. It was um, shortly after I turned in my cut of Stranger Worlds. Then I got the call to do Picard. Hmm. Yeah. What, what was the big transition like, or, or if any, to go from one to the other, did you, notice any differences or or was it kind of a seamless thing i mean they're in different countries so the whole crew and the mentality on set is very different where you know in toronto it really feels like um it's the crew that could they're like almost it almost feels like a big budget indie movie where you could do anything you want with the crew there that has experience on discovery and uh, strange in the world and this one is seasoned LA professionals and, you know, just the experience, even starting from the cast with all the next generation to everyone working on set. It's just a different mentality. I wouldn't say it's um, better or worse. I would just say it's you're coming into it from a very LA perspective and we shoot our stages are admittedly smaller than in Canada. So I don't know. Really? Some people okay. say something about, uh, you know, how many sets we have and we do have a amount of sets like that hallway, um, the corridor is actually Mm -hmm. just a T intersection corridor and another long corridor. And that the length is not even close to what we have in Stranger Worlds. But because of the way um, the camera guys and the DP and us plan it out with the uh, blueprints and all the scenes, you don't really feel it, I feel, watching these episodes. So you're talking about the corridor on the Titan? Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. That's really cool. I didn't even notice. (laughs) Yeah, there's a little less space in the stages here. But just creatively, I think they've managed to um, change it up enough. And, you know, they can change certain lighting and panels in between scenes just to, like, mix it up. And that's often what we do. And even in Canada, like, uh, we have this one really long um, half circle corridor, but they'll change the panels. And sometimes we'll add the glass uh, panels there to indicate what department um, hallway it is. Uh, And, you know, they just do clever tricks to reuse that set and make it look fresh and new. Yeah, that corridor actually did seem like it was long um, when I was watching this episode. Um, Jack was in it a few times. I think there were a few shots with Jack in there. Um, one with uh, Picard and Roe, if I'm not mistaken. But it yeah. did feel like, you know, the depth behind was extremely long. Is that a backdrop or how are you going no, to No, no, uh, it, it kind of curves and that's where it ends Mm, so you know you have that you have that distance and then you just choose some scenes to shoot it at a higher angle some scenes to shoot at a lower angle some scenes will just try to get to this on the side more and um through a door so there's different ways to make it look different but essentially that's what it is so upon watching uh episode five here whether you watched it just again today or whether you just watched it a year ago Was there, what really stood out? Was there a moment where you were like really proud where you're like, man, that is a good shot that I wanted, or that's a really good, you know, uh, delivery of some lines that I helped to coach. Was there anything that that really jumped out at you that you're really proud of? Patrick and Michelle at the bar, you know, at at, all of their scenes, they brought so much background to it. I mean, you could tell the actors were excited, even as we talked about them before the before rolling even as we talk through the scenes 
even in prep, like everyone was excited about these scenes. And so there was this sort of energy right away as we started doing them. And then for my job, you know, it's to get variations on that energy and sometimes to bring that energy down or sometimes to raise it. But it was all there to play with. And when you have that ready to try different things and mold and the actors are all game to, you know, give variations, that's the most fun you can have as a director. Because, you know, that's what I think of as real directing is where you and a couple actors get together and you guys play. Mm -hmm. um, and everything else. You know, there's a lot of like puzzle piecing, a lot of dynamic stuff you can do for directing. But uh, character work for me is always the most exciting because also that's not predetermined. You know, we have to obviously get the meaning of the script across, but how you do that can be magical sometimes. And I think that's what Michelle and Patrick brought um, anytime they were together on the set. Wow. Yeah, I have to say that I also like the scene with... Uh... Michelle Hurd and Michael Dorn, yeah, when they were going through the whole clean, you know, through the fight scene. Um, and by the way, the villain was very well cast too. Uh, the Vulcan villain who played Crin, I thought was good. I liked his voice. I liked his yeah. Uh, Just to add delivery. to that, I didn't because I he didn't seem kind of like a typical Vulcan. Like I, it's tough to really tell, but he doesn't look like he was terribly tall and we always kind of imagined Vulcans to be at least somewhat tall and slender and he kind of seemed a little less but it's tough to really tell but he just had this really interesting cadence and voice right uh really yeah. cool though gave a really good character yeah I mean part That's of that I think uh he's such a great actor that I knew growing up watching Fringe and we used them in Walking Dead but Terry Metalis used him in 12 Monkeys so I think they've always been looking for an excuse to bring that talent, um, you know, he, his, he's such a high caliber actor to bring him back into some work they did. And just when he said these lines, because he talks very differently in real life. And when he just became really? Vulcan, you're just like, oh, hey, that's pretty cool. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was a thing to his voice where it was like, oh, God, it's the villain voice, it's the great villain voice. Um, you look for those kinds of things and there was inflections in his voice that I thought, oh, he's pulling off this villain voice extra uh, good. And uh, But that scene with Michael Dorn and Michelle, um, and what, I, I was like, in my, I was like, oh, shit, they just killed Warp. And uh, <laughs> I really thought it went down. Like, you you sold me on that. I was fully sold. Thank uh, you. Um, you know, that's a lot of work with the stunt department as well because how these things work, um, at least for me, is when you're prepping, you get a heads up, however many weeks you're gonna be shooting the scene. And then you meet with the stunt department and you talk about the script and you talk about your hopes and wishes. They go off and do their choreography and you come and meet them after they've done the choreography. And then we all kind of, me and the fight coordinator and the stunt coordinator watch their the stunt doubles reenact this and we'll like think about it and talk about it. And then any modifications to make, any like things to own, something I think that might, uh, Michelle might look better doing or something rather than a different move. And we'll just tweak it a little bit until we send it for approval, which falls to Terry. And then they start teaching the actors. And, you know, we, I always like for all of my stunt scenes to be very much ahead of the game because I believe the actor needs to rehearse because I want to use mm -hmm. their face as much as possible. So, you know, they had two weeks to rehearse this and then we did it. Now, uh, they said this on the ready room but we actually had to cut their fight shorter because um, on the day due to production issues, we had two hours less to shoot the scene. Oh, no. So, you know, as I was waiting and for us to be up and shoot the scene, they were like, oh, uh, we don't think you can, we can finish this. The sound guy said, because you only have two hours. And I'm like, okay, let's get the actors together, look at the choreography and really make the deep cuts and, uh, luckily, you know, they were okay with that. Obviously with two weeks of training, no one's happy that we have to miss out on some of those moments, especially since if you notice there's certain moves that call back to their practice fight. And mm -hmm. the whole point of it is Worf is essentially reenacting the practice fight with her to show her and him to come up with a plan to fake his death. Mm -hmm. Right. And he's, and there's a lot of like looks between them. And in the original choreography, it was more her realizing um, what he's trying to tell her and hit kind of her telling him through moves that it's okay, I'm going to do this. And so mm -hmm. there was about 
two more sections of fight that we couldn't shoot that we had oh, to with in. with the with the communication happening between them kind of while thing. doing moves while like mm -hmm. um you know because along with the headbutt there was uh, a, a wrap around a couple other like slashes um, a couple kicks and so we all truncated it into a much more shootable version but i think it still got the point across luckily <laughs> mm -hmm. no, it definitely it did. did and what a bummer though to yeah because uh th those actors were probably very proud and the stunt coordinators and the and the stunt doubles very proud of what they put together but it's great that you know kind of came out looking seamless i actually wanted to add to that which was you you did such a great job and the editors and the actors and the stunt people did such a great job of making it seamless to where we couldn't tell where the stunt person was the stunt double and where the actor was and a lot of that has to be training on the actor's parts to be able to sell these moves when the camera is on them you know like when michelle heard does the little double flip with the with the uh piping mm -hmm. or you know when there's just a swing or something going on and you're looking at that's her face that's <laughs> michael dorn's face so that was really well done it was seamless i couldn't catch anything there so uh, thank you yeah you i mean we to do that you have to shoot it you know in uh all the different configurations where you shoot the actors then one actor with one stunt double where they're not afraid to actually like hurt them <laughs> so they can because the stunt <laughs> double knows how to take a hit um uh, more than a regular actor would and then you shoot the stunt doubles in wides so there's a couple different ways where it just when it comes together, it just comes together. I mean, and I'm glad we could still get both of their face in some moments, like when Worf does a little knife flip and then it pans over to Raffi and she's like, oh, okay, come on. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and I want to ask you about that because this actually seemed to have some of the best uh, fight scenes uh, filming that I've seen in Star Trek. Uh, there were moments, the other moment that I thought worked really well and was shot well was the jack crusher against the changelings fight scene wow he does yeah. this kind of reverse headlock kind of kind of weird neck move and i love that um and so i guess my question is your your experience and your background of, of of working in these kinds of environments and filming these kinds of fight scenes really translated well into this uh genre of sci-fi thank you yeah i'm also i've done wushu for 18 years so, you know, um, I've been, a lot of my friends are stuntmen and stuntwomen in Los Angeles. So you said you've done wushu, wushu, wushu for, yeah. for 18, 18 years. years. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So you uh, understand the, the fight. Yeah. Part. That's why I like to get in on the choreography with the stunt guys to see what they come up with. Cause I'm excited uh, when right. they come up with cool stuff. I'm like, oh, that looks great. Um, so, you know, I, I really like to be involved. And I think part of that uh, was, in my first meeting after I got the script, I really emphasized to um, everyone involved, the ADs and the producers, like, we need to get the ball rolling because there's three action sequences here and they're hand to hand. And it's going to, you know, need a lot of prep if we want to pull it off. And so they're like, oh, OK, like how much time? And so then we worked <laughs> out that schedule. I made sure everyone could train properly. Um, and, you know, actually, that Jack fight, uh, I'm very proud of, but it's what they told me it was one of the first times where on camera the phaser switches the kill mode. Because if you notice, it's blue in stun yeah. mode. And then he disarms the guy with a move, switches it to kill mode, and turns and shoots the girl, and then all the other changelings in the fight. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was yeah. like a really fun detail to include. Um, and just the fact that it's not done often. So let's mm -hmm. do it. You know what else is and not done? Often? Made him look like a real badass too. I mean, he looks like he yeah. looks like the guy not to mess with. <laughs> yeah, but you know what else doesn't happen often uh, in Star Trek until recently is good fight scenes. <laughs> I just yeah, I just when, yeah. when Sirach was just saying like a good Star Trek fight scene, it kind of hit me. I was like, that's right. Yeah. Uh, Star used Trek to the in the past, yeah, the double hand. Hand handle. I mean, that was a different time period. <laughs> yeah, you're killing it. You, I mean, you, you killed it. That's what yeah. I'm saying. You really Dang. raised the bar, and I've never seen it done where I actually look back and say, "Wow, that's like a a martial arts movie moment," mm -hmm. you know, in, in a Star Trek episode. I, I've never felt that. I always felt like, okay, this is you know some phaser action, or usually one punch, a counter, and then another. But not an actual choreographed full like you know fight scene, and I I, I enjoy it. That was one of my treats in this episode, as, as well as the storyline and the pace. 
and you kept the pace going on. And uh, you mentioned editing. Is that also part of the the final product, the music, the editing? Are you oh, involved absolutely. all the way through? Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm not because in television, the director has kind of four days to edit, and then you just hope and pray that they uh, like and keep as much as uh, they can. And for streamers. Um, we've been very lucky where the time limit is not as a factor as the old days. Cause you know, back in star Trek, well, I grew up with the next generation uh, where my mom would play it on TV um, when I was a little kid. And, you know, back in those days, they were locked down to 42 minutes. Mm -hmm. So, you know what, like, what's the first thing to cut out to take down time? Uh, what about a big long shot VFX shot of a, uh, behind um, one of the enterprises or whatever, you know, it's or a like, long fight yeah, scene or, or a long fight scene, cut that out because we need to get the story and plot moving. And um, you don't need to do that as much with streaming. Obviously there's still a limit, just audience attention span, like what actually feels natural. Um, so you don't want it to go on forever, but I think there's a lot more artistic license to be had. And one thing I'm actually very surprised, pleasantly surprised is how good Terry is, is with, the spaceship VFX, because a lot of those are kind of just scripted one-liners. And on Strange New Worlds, um, the directors are more involved in the kind of previs of it with the VFX team. But with this one, the time being so tight and me focusing on fight scenes and VFX for in the show, those kind of exterior shots, you're just like, two ships here. Or like, you know, you kind of just like ride a slug. And then like, that's all the showrunner coming up with those uh, exterior shots unless it's like a scripted moment where the ship crashes into a cell type of thing but mm -hmm. like all of those kind of just like um even the intrepid appearing you know that exactly. was uh, it's beautiful like we had one line and he just made it happen <laughs> it's like nice good job yeah i was just going to yeah. mention that when the intrepid shows up and they're kind of nose to nose and uh they really don't you know this team really does not skimp out on the vfx or the details within the vfx like you can zoom in forever and it still looks beautiful uh the attention to detail is amazing that stuff takes forever and it's super expensive and it doesn't go unnoticed the talent uh and the resources that go into these yeah i mean even the art when in our art meetings when you see kind of like the renderings and the concept arts like dave blass and his team have done mm -hmm. amazing detailed work and i love that he's such a Star Trek nerd that you can just kind of pick his brain about tiny little moments or even what does this do on the ship? Why is this here? And like, well, what if it lights up this way? Or what if it's over here? Or can we move this over here? And, you know, you'll have an encyclopedic knowledge between the people that work with him or him uh, that just really makes all the sets and uh, even some of the VFX look brilliant. Oh, and one more thing. Sorry. Uh on the VFX, I actually put in my notes, a lot of asterisks in my notes. Wow, the Daystrom station looks beautiful. It, it wasn't a very long shot, but I, I did rewind and look at it like two or three times because it looked phenomenal. <laughs> I just want, I had to point that yeah. out. In the, in the preview scene in the ready room, you can see they're um, looking over a map of it uh, in, as they're talking about what could happen in the next episode. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I also like how they, when they're giving us the ship porn moments and they're giving us those beautiful shots, they slow it down and kind of move the camera as they're moving us around and giving us like, we know you want to see this. We know you guys want to look at this moment and savor it. And I love <laughs> that, that pause to, you know, soak it in and give us guys that want to see that, the moment to celebrate it. Um, but yeah, this, I mean, you know, the story was really great. And you talked about um, guys that know a lot, of, you know, Star Trek nerds. I felt like this was real candy for the Star Trek nerds as far as storyline, too, because we had a lot of the backstory on uh, Commander Rowe and the Bajorans and, and just a, that entire um, meaty stuff, which gave us very um, – sentimental and emotional moments where I felt very connected to the story. Um, and you mentioned working with Picard in those kind of uh, scenes in the bar. I thought it worked very well and you, you played the softness of it um, the way I wanted to see it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of my prep was just 
having her episodes on loop uh, while I was working throughout the weeks in prep. Oh, cool. And, you know, you can kind of just see the dynamics they played with. And when you're working with them, a lot of times it isn't telling actors directly. It's kind of setting up the opportunity for them to, you know, go where you're hoping they would go. And they would always take place, take like the scene to places I hope for and more. So, you know, sometimes you'd see that and you're like, oh, can we lean into this more? Or, oh, really like this moment. Let's try it like uh, on a close up as well, uh, you know? And they just, they're such pros. And I think part of that was Patrick just hasn't done a scene with her that he could actually use his personal experience from all that time back then and the next generation days. And, you know, I think, you know, you read about the interviews on Picard and it really seems like that is what resonates where he, as a person in real life, he can remember the time when he was filming that. And he brings a lot of that to Picard meeting these characters again. And that's what's special about this season is like, you know, you get that all the time, but like in such subtle and like heartwarming ways. You know, uh, we only have you for a couple more minutes here, Dan, but I, I've got to ask you that, we know the directors here on uh, Picard, they do two at a time, two episodes at a time. It's really cool. Um, it's it's a great idea. And, you know, it kind of, you kind of get a hint as to the rhythm of a season, you know, whether it's episode to episode, you know, or or in this case, it was like a, a four episode block. Maybe, you know, maybe the next four episodes are, are also a block. And then the final two is like, you know, the, the final chapter um, or the third act. But as a director, does that help you uh, creatively, logistically? Does it make things difficult? Because now you're doing two episodes back to back. What's that experience like? It's tremendously helpful because I think as, you know, a journeyman director um, or journeywoman directors for them, uh, you're just coming into a show and meeting people for the first time most more often than not. So the longer and more time you can spend with them, the more you can kind of bring things out of everybody as you work with them. So I love doing blocks. You know, I'd love doing more than a block just uh, in general um, in my line of work, just so that, you know, you can really get to know uh, the crew, you can get to know the cast and you can really like follow their story along the whole season. And so, you know, I'm always excited when I can extend my uh, stay as a director. Um, I know Strange New Worlds is very episodic, so every episode feels different, which is why one director does one. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, for Picard, kind of the longer uh, storytelling um, narrative, then it is nice to have uh, two episodes to kind of work that story in and try to get your perspective into it. Um, it's it's really cool. And when you're making that pr uh, transition, uh, who is it that works alongside you the most that helps you kind of get acclimated to certain, for example, the lighting of uh, the different set sets? Is it the cinematographer that really helps with the continuity uh, from one um, episode to the next? It's uh, AD and cinematographer. Um, so, you know, in prep, you'll owe it, well, on shows with this budget, they usually have two cinematographers, one with the director to prep and shoot with them while the other one is prepping and shooting with the next block director. So then you have your DP and you have your AD and your second AD. So those three people are kind of like your, you know, your personal crew where like you guys really get to the nitty gritty, you figure out what's on for this season, uh, what's different, what you can do and just, yeah, well, what, what are we going to do with the script? Um, is it uh, shootable? <laughs> <laughs> you know my first thought of that when you were uh talking about the different crew people my first thought was i wonder who on the crew is like the captain shaw of the production the guy that says no <laughs> you don't have to answer that i'm guessing it's the line producer but we don't even have to <laughs> you don't have to confirm or deny uh but dan this has been so much fun and we really are happy for your success uh with several productions you've had in the past plus strange new worlds plus picard and everybody you heard it here first He's available for an entire season block. So not <laughs> yeah, just two episodes. Yeah. He's going, he wants the whole thing. Uh, Absolutely. But yeah, Dan, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we wish you continued success and uh, hope you get more episodes. Thank you. Enjoy the final season of Picard. It's pretty special. 
I think we will. <laughs> we're, we're, yeah, we're loving this final season. Uh, this episode was fantastic. It's funny because it's just, it's almost getting better and better where I think it can't. And it's just um, beating my expectations. And Dan, you, you really uh, delivered a fine episode, uh, something to really be proud of. And I'm, you know, grateful to have met you and wish you continued success. Thank you guys. Nice he's thinking you. right now he's thinking just wait till you see next week uh <laughs> but uh well, everybody next week and i can also plug strange new world season two so Ooh, are you yeah well i guess we can't uh, get into that but uh, <laughs> no, spoilers, no spoilers we don't have to plug it everybody's super excited about strange new worlds too so uh we're looking forward to that very much um everybody at home stick around we'll be right back uh and dan thank you very much we'll be right back on the seventh rule Hi, everybody. Welcome back to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton. Yeah, hello, hello. Here are the trivioids of the week. We've been dying to hear them. And here they are. Jack Crusher sleepwalks. The Titan is getting repairs. Captain Shaw kind of knights seven of nine. Worf's weakness is talking. Uh, same, bro. Worf <laughs> and Raffi are now the alphas of District 6. Worf waits for the ecology of District 6 to write itself. Captain Shaw is feeling chipper, and Picard practiced his Bajoran for 30 years. Uh, man, so this was good stuff. Uh, there were a lot of fun little Easter eggs in this one. We also saw our buddy uh, Jin Maley get a lot of uh, FaceTime as Ensign yeah, Esmar. That was Jin. fun, right? Yeah, absolutely. And they're all very these... good to see. And then, and then I was like, what are you killing Jin? Yeah, already there yeah, i was like what the heck's going on in this episode? yeah but and i should have known it was one of those vision dream sequences things. right what's going yeah, on there yeah. he's he's sleepwalking he's constantly imagining things it's not just when he's asleep he's like standing there you know uh imagining killing the transporter chief or whatever that was uh there's all kinds of stuff and now he's hearing voices jack crusher is um I don't know, though. I usually have uh, theories, I, but I, I don't uh, this time. I, I don't know, but I will say, and this is my only, I have no validation of this, but I, it sounds like the voice that's calling to him in his head, telling him to come to him or something like that. It sounds like the voice of the main villain of um, Amanda Plummer's character. I heard that as well, but I also thought I heard a, a also Beverly's voice. You know, yeah, so uh, I can't. Beverly. I have no comp. Yeah, I have no confirmation. It just sounded like it, mm -hmm. and I'm like, is that is there a connection between this villain and Jack? Um, so that's my only. That's all I got on that. Uh, definitely something's going on because uh, he's seeing all type of red doors. And all. <laughs> I don't want to be in his head. <laughs> now, also, uh, if you'll recall, back in the day, we would always talk about on Deep Space Nine that Major Kira's character was based off of somebody. It was that's Ro. Uh, her character was based off of this character, uh, and she was originally going to be the spinoff character on Deep Space Nine. Um, you know, Chief O'Brien was going to be there as well. But um, so Major Kira was based off of this character, uh, Ro Laren, but she declined. And so then they changed it to Major Kira and they cast an off visitor and the rest is history. But there's a lot of. Uh, history there mm. in the next generation with this character so that's why the internet presumably and most assuredly is exploding with this character coming back she wasn't in a ton of episodes but she had quite an impact uh she's also a great actor you know she was in uh some really amazing episodes of Battlestar Galactica in the past and a bunch of other stuff but I was wondering what what your impression of her kind of with like fresh eyes was. Great actor. Um, I enjoyed the chemistry between uh, Ro and Descartes. You could mm. tell there was this history there. You could tell that uh, he had felt betrayed. He conveyed that very well in this episode. Um but yeah, I was very moved when the, the moment came 
and Roe handed the earring, you know, and, you know, all that talk about the earring. I really have the earring. I had it this whole time and I'm giving it to you. And the whole dialogue about, you know, I'm going to give you what you gave me, which is a fighting chance. Mm-hmm. I thought those were really good, well written. I mean, these episodes are well written. They are giving you just enough of the, you know, the moment where, you know, everything pauses and two people have to say what they need to say. But it doesn't happen like while the whole thing's blowing up and everything's cr- crashing down. It, it's at the appropriate moments. And um, the tempo is just lovely in, in the show. Hmm. And by the way, Michelle Forbes, uh, the actress that plays uh, Roe Laren, I keep wanting to call her Ensign Roe, but she's commander now. Um, she looked fantastic. She acted beautifully. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, you always kind of wonder when somebody's at least perceivably, from my point of view, I haven't seen her in, in anything since Battlestar Galactica, which is like 2006 or something like that. So you wonder, you know. How are they doing? What's new with them? How have they changed? Are they still great at acting? You know, what's what's the story? And man, I feel like she even got better as an actress. She was really good. Um, so I was really happy about that. It was great to see her and it was great to see the actress really nailing it. 100 percent brought up, brought out some of the best performance out of uh, Patrick Stewart yeah. that I've seen in this show because um, he really got deep and personal i i like the whole bar scene i thought was excellent when he you know he takes the safety protocols off the bar and kind of does hey no no i just got the that was slick here. it was slick it was great it was filmed well he played it off well um mm-hmm. i just thought it was done well and there was the chemistry was great um there was also moments when picard has to tell shaw that he needs to take off and run because, you know, Starfleet's compromised and they're about to get shot at. I like the drama there, too. There was just the, the drama was there, you know, and I thought mm-hmm, it definitely. was well delivered on both ends. Um, from the from Shaw's perspective of like kind of having the dilemma of he said something to the effect that I'm not going to turn my crew into a bunch of fugitives. That's uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, he's, he's faced with that decision, like, on the spot. And, of course, Picard looks at him and says, well, you're going to have to trust me. You know, and I think that was a, another big moment in this episode. I just thought this episode was full of really good stuff. The, the scenes between uh, Michelle Hurd, Michael Dorn, yeah. Rafi and Worf, they have a great chemistry together. Raffaella. Very well. Raffaella. <laughs> their, their chemistry is amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's fun to watch them go back and forth with each other. Um, when she, when he calls her Raffaella, she should call him like an extended name, like, like Wolfman or, or Kessel Warfenstein, or it's just kind of <laughs> something. I don't know if that would work, but you know, uh, what's the name? Uh, Shaw also made some really cool, uh, uh, references when he was talking to, uh, Picard and, and Riker, he says, you hot dropped the saucer section of the Enterprise D on a planet or that time that someone threw the prime directive out the window to snog a villager on Baku or the time that you boys nearly wiped all of humanity by creating a time paradox in the Devron system. So what's cool about that obviously is they are the, that Star Trek uh, next generation fans will know those are actual movies and episodes uh, the first one, the saucer section, that was uh, uh, Star Trek Generations, the first Next Generation movie. And uh, Snogging a Villager on Baku, that was Star Trek Insurrection. That was the third Next Generation movie. And the last thing was the the time paradox in the Devron system. That's actually the final episode, all good things of Next Generation. So I was like, are those like movie and episode nams? I don't know. But it was really cool because... Star Trek fans are all like, oh, oh, that's odd that, you know, so of course we go back to like, listen to it again, but those were really good references and Captain Shaw has studied them well. Do love Captain Shaw. Well, he's Shaw. watched all the movies. Captain Shaw. <laughs> that's what it is. He's just a Trekkie. <laughs> that's what it is. <laughs> uh, 
but but yeah um you know back to that um michelle forbes scene you know when she says you know you broke my heart and he says and you broke mine and i thought that at the end uh picard says if if that pain tells us anything it's that it's that we are who we say we are exactly i love that line i thought it was just perfect it was like that's confirmation enough that mm-hmm. you're you feel that way i feel this way we had a real like heart to heart and kind of a open exactly. conversation with each other and so that's enough validation i don't need a blood test or a dna test right because to- uh and that was really cool when uh beverly crusher sent him the little message where the blood test doesn't work so now picard's like okay i can't test them physically i can't test them mentally so i have mm-hmm. to test them emotionally i got to see what this changeling or Bajoran feels like. And the a changeling would not have that emotion, would not, even if they could fake the emotion, they would not know believably which emotion to fake. Uh, but Picard mm-hmm. knows that she is reacting in a real way. So that's really cool. That's a uh, brilliant writing. Well done by Cindy Appel and Chris Derrick. And of course, Terry Metalis. And beautifully done by Dan Liu, directing that. And he said that was his favorite scene or the one he was most proud of. Great stuff. Uh, and, you know, I, I can't stop singing Todd Stashwick's praises because he's ridiculous when it comes to delivering lines. He's just, he's... he's I'm he's starting to hate him by by how, because of how good he is. It's making yeah. me feel bad about myself. They, they need <laughs> to bring back The Office just so that he has the platform to do all of the stuff that he does so well. I think he can star in The Office. Uh, the you mean like be the, the next office. Steve Carell? Yes. Oh, yes. my God. That would be so good. <laughs> yes. He, he has that Steve Carell where he can say he could just be that guy. Oh, that's uh, brilliant. <clears throat> but so anyways, so, you know, the lines he says. So when he finally gets his shit back and, you know, and. Riker's like, okay, I'm giving you your shit back. You're now in charge again. He finally gets back in charge, and he was like on his best behavior up until that moment. And then finally, he as soon as he, he makes them the eat fire, shit so hard, right? <laughs> <laughs> it was so, so beautiful. It was so yeah. beautifully written. Uh, first, he goes to seven of nine and says, "You want in or out?" You know, and, and she's like, "I'll take in." And he's like, "Okay," but he said uh, basically, he's saying like. While you're getting tried and court-martialed or whatever, yeah. do you want to be that as an officer or as a non-officer? Yeah. So good. And when he says, you could get you guys, I'll give you plenty of time. As a courtesy, yes. I'm going to give you time to get your bullshit straight or something like that. <laughs> yeah, it's your brilliant. bullshit story straight. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I just thought that. Uh, he's like, oh, by the way, I already did call Starfleet. And they're on their way. <laughs> like, it's just like, <laughs> like, I'm not going down for any of this, guys. Is an all A plus on you. character, A plus, mm-hmm. and then the line he gives, which made me really, I'm like, this guy's just every line he gets, he just he turns one line into like the quotable line of the story. Like, so he's the guy that's always in the movie clip when they show what the movie's about. He's got the line in the movie where they're like, you know, I'll be back or whatever. Right. It's whatever he. Or what says you're talking about, part. Willis? <laughs> yeah, he's, <laughs> but... he's got the line, you know, and this yeah. one was. Uh, you know, at some point he says, uh, oh yeah, that was the fastest court martial I've ever seen. It was hilarious. I just loved the way he delivered it. There are some memes out there right now that basically have Captain Shaw's face and his catchphrase below it. And basically it's just his face and the catchphrase is no. (laughs) (laughs) Chef's kiss. That's perfect. That's his catchphrase. That's it. No, <laughs> no, that's it. That's it. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but right away in the beginning of this opening of this episode, there was a sound effect, and it reminded me, and I'm pretty sure, yeah, it was of the original, the original series. series, just the 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 beat, the honing beacon yeah. sound, or whatever that the they boom, use, right, or whatever's going on there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I and put they, that. They I, I said, I hear the ding there. of the TOS bridge, and then we heard it as we're coming into the ship, if I remember correctly. But then we also right. heard another similar sound a little bit later on on that bridge as well, once or twice as well. But it was very, you know, 
two or three times max, kind of faint, okay. but it's but unmistakable. It obvious in mm -hmm. the beginning, right? And mm -hmm. I was like, oh, that's a nice little touch. They just, that one little thing brought me back to the original series and kind of Beautiful. paid its homage. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's just, just too many. Like I said, I keep saying the wharf getting uh, killed scene. Um, you know, when he says today is a good day to die and you are a mighty or what does he say? You, you are a mighty warrior or something. You are, uh, uh, you are a warrior and this is a worthy death. Mm -hmm. uh, I enjoyed that whole line. Um, also, when he came, came back around and said, Klingons never disappointed. I just, I, just, I love that whole scene. I really did. Um, and I even loved when he kind of starts to brag about, I mastered Kalis art of <laughs> heart, you know, heart regulation or he likes heart to talk. <laughs> yeah. And then he coughs in the middle because he, <laughs> his own bragging kind of, you know, inflames the injury. So I thought that was well played and a little comic relief there. Um, mm -hmm. Starfleet being compromised. Whoa. That's another you know, throwback to Deep Space Nine in the whole uh, was home front episode. Yeah, and Paradise mistaken. Lost. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So this is a callback to the infiltration of the changelings in in Starfleet, right? But apparently it's worse, uh, is what they're insinuating, is that it's right. even deeper. Right. There's way more of them. I mean, there were just four right there on the ship. And if I remember correctly, uh, in Paradise Lost or Homefront, uh, the change links tells him uh, there are four on the entire planet. And he said, you know, something to the effect of if just four of us can wreak this much havoc on your planet, imagine what we could do, you know, whatever. So there are a ton. We don't know how many, uh, but they killed yeah. four at least. And, yeah. And I didn't know Jack Crusher's middle name was Reacher. Jack because Reacher, he is very good. <laughs> you didn't know Jack. <laughs> Cuz he went full Jack Reacher in that in that hallway which was kind of, you know, these are changelings, boy. They 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 weren't the best of the batch cuz if I'm a changeling, you you're going I'm switching into something that'll kick your ass, you know. <laughs> well, see, we don't even into, really uh, know if these are some kind of changeling hybrid or what because they're they're having some differences like they can replicate organs. They can replicate blood. You know, yeah. Uh, there's there's a lot going on here. So either they are a completely different kind of changeling, like a different. It, it, it's possible. Maybe should, there's just another planet with similar changelings, or uh, I think they mentioned Odo said that they've that some of the changelings have split off and they're like a rogue faction. So they've clearly done some changes or enhancements or or something. To where now they're like super changelings. They're like ultra changelings. <laughs> yeah, they're like gremlins in water or something. But uh, <laughs> I have a question for you. Did you did you pick up on the Nams? Yeah, we got uh, Admiral Janeway. Yep. Uh, Sneed yep. was a Nam because he wasn't on there. Uh, also, they uh, the earring was a data chip. So uh, <laughs> I don't know if that counts. Okay, okay. Uh, those uh, are the only ones I got. Chancellor, what else? Chancellor Rowe, somebody? No, Chancellor Roll. Uh, I don't think Roll? so. I didn't look it up, but okay. I didn't recognize that name. But it's always interesting when they give us a new character. I mean, naming somebody we already okay. know is cool, but giving us somebody new is also cool. Um, but we did get a lot on the view screen when they were looking up uh Kryn, if you'll recall when he was looking up Kryn, there was a bunch of names on there i didn't write okay. them down because i know that all of the cool star trek nerds would for us so let me take a quick check here that our buddy uh don crandall i'm sure sent them over let me see um okay i'm gonna check elsewhere but there, there were a few names that were mentioned here we are uh dr Anne marie seagull sent this one in oh laurel of renia uh was on the view screen check this out here laurel because you're warfit 
No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Sneed of Ferenginar, Toluco of Romulus, right? But Laurel was from a Deep Space Nine episode, if you'll recall, Who Mourns for Morn? She was mm. like uh, one of the, you know, the, the, the gangsters or whatever, you know, they were trying to get uh, the Morn's oh, okay. money or whatever when that episode where he was missing. Also, in another screenshot here, uh, you'll recognize a couple other names, of course. It makes sense that Morn of Luria was there. He was there in a previous episode. We already knew that. Kryn, that's Kryn. Um, oh, mm -hmm. there's Data. See, Brunt. shout out to Data. And Brunt of Ferenginar. Also, the Okuna. <laughs> Okona. This was a guy in Next Generation that was also in Prodigy a couple episodes. Okona, the guy with like the, the darkish hair and the eye patch. Daddy, dad, Daddy and Okona. Daddy and Okona, yeah. But yeah, Brunt, mm -hmm. FCA. So he's uh, he's up on the most wanted list. That those guys are are mentioned as associates of Sneed's. So when they were like researching Sneed and his associates, these are the people that came up. Oh, okay. So it's nice to know Brunt is still alive and kicking, and being a scoundrel. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in the belly of the underworld. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, speaking of which, I did like the guy who played this Kryn character. I know I mentioned it before, but uh, the moment I enjoyed a lot when uh, Rafi says, um, "Did you factor in that my friends, or you know, you know, he's bleeding and dying over there? You know, that'll kind of accelerate Speed things up." Yeah. And Worf says, "You will give me the information, something to that effect." And I love the line that he said. He said, that would be logical. <laughs> like, yeah, I think I'm going to give you that info since I don't want my head chopped off right now. <laughs> yeah, that actor really did nail it. The uh, Kryn actor. He, uh, he really he did, did. And he played it like a Vulcan, I thought. He played mm -hmm. it like a wicked Vulcan. Um, mm -hmm. They did add kind of this tattoo effect on his face with a bunch of like lines coming down, squiggly lines coming down. Love it. They didn't really explain explain that but i just that's i guess that's just like you know his tattoo kind of cool shit he had a scar on his face as well but i was wondering about the tattoos on the face like you know maybe he was vulcan and mixed with something else or you know yeah i didn't i mean i didn't recognize the tattoo i just thought it looked cool i don't know if it's from anything or anything we're supposed to no, I think it just was really cool to see that, you know, it definitely adds to the character. It gets us to to think of him as a different flavor. It gives, you know, because if the character is only going to be around for an episode, presumably, for all we know, uh, rather than just make him a, you know, piece of exposition, give that character some depth, just like Sneed. Remember, Sneed was just in that one episode, I believe, but... They gave him a lot to work with, and the actor played him really well. And suddenly, Sneed becomes this Sneed, really. Sneed was the Ferengi. Yeah, was the Ferengi that they killed. Yeah. Okay. And he suddenly becomes this really interesting character in just a few uh, few scenes. Hmm. Yeah, and you know another thing that this show is doing a great job of is telling a story within an episode. Yeah. And then. At the very end of the episode, after concluding whatever happened in front of us and wrapping it up in a nice little bow, they un start to unwrap the next present for us. And at this episode, the unwrapping was, you know, I thought was another great job when, first of all, uh, Captain Shaw gives his catchphrase, you know, everybody has, you know, engage or, you know, make it so or whatever it is that they yell. Uh, Shaw said let's get out of here that was his uh yeah you know his closing line or his let's make like know. a baby and head out he says yeah <laughs> so his let's get out of here but the moment after that was Riker saying uh they're they're coming for us and Picard responds who exactly and Riker's line was Everyone, everyone. Mm -hmm. because now and they've was, been framed so now everybody right. thinks that they killed commander Roe because the changelings right. framed them so now the intrepid 
and all the others are going to be gunning for them. So that's the direction that it's going to be going is now Captain right. Shaw is the captain of, you know, the, the freedom fighter starship that's being chased by the other good guy. You know, it's, it's going to be cool. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, uh, we also got a, a nice closing on this episode about, uh, you know, Crusher, Jack, um, being telling his mom that something's wrong with him. So there was uh, there's some kind of information exchange there, which is great. We got that. And also the data chip earring was another gem drop for what's to come. So there's a lot of uh, drop dropping of gems for next episodes, which is great. They leave it. They leave the cliffhanger. They close out the episode. And like I said, I'm enjoying the, the pace. Uh, and they do feel like motion picture quality storytelling uh, for me totally and you know what else does it's so cool that they have the end credits they put the credits at the end with these beautiful star trek scores oh mm -hmm. it's so good it feels like I'm, it, it feels like i'm sitting in a movie theater watching the end credits of an awesome star trek movie when those end credits come up i'm actually not turning off the end credits i'm sitting there watching especially the music is so good the music and yeah it's just beautiful it feels like a movie and the you know the the visuals are great that's it's awesome i love that touch that they that they did with that really cool yeah uh and and you know also dan mentioned the visual effects guys but those guys are really kicking ass when the um intrepid kind of turns on the titan and is you know starting to align itself to yep. go face heads up i thought those graphics were great uh you know one of its engines were burning because it had been sabotaged by row and i just liked the, mo the moment it just looked like and then they fired tor those torpedoes and just as the torpedoes are about to hit they take off going warp so there's nothing to hit i just it was just really cool visual effects as well and um you know i'm excited about this season i think it's you know when it's all said and done you'll you'll be able to play this third season like a like a movie back on on end one episode after the next it will actually run like a 10 hour movie yeah uh, another interesting thing is that uh you know with the bajorans how they have their their names backwards and forwards or whatever like that so ro is like her last name her first name's pretty long. It's Kamatmeeb. What? <laughs> it's Kamatmeeb, bro. Um, oh, God. <laughs> that was, uh, that was let's, terrible. Oh, let's God. see if Don Crandall can save us. Our yeah. good buddy Don Crandall <laughs> sent in a few notes here. Um, oh, oh, the man. so he sent in some images of the movies that captain shaw was referencing uh here's one when they were dropping the saucer section on a planet pretty cool captain it was uh being it was being piloted by deanna troy so that's something that she has never lived down marina Sirtis is that the one time she takes the helm she crashes the, the ship so <laughs> of course not her fault but it's just like a funny thing that people like to razz her about um also when he uh when Captain Picard snogs the villager that is here, I believe her name is Donna Murphy. She's kind of a big deal. Um, oh, that's how they meant snogs. <laughs> snog. I thought it had to. I thought it had to do with nog, but there's nothing. Oh, there's our buddy. Um. Oh, oh, and Don Crandall says the Intrepid class, you know, because the ship was the USS Intrepid. That is what the USS Voyager is. It's an Intrepid class ship. That's good knowledge there. Um, uh, void. Oh, great, great, good point. Uh, the Voyager's Voyager Doctor's mobile emitter. Remember how they shot Raffi and she disappeared, and then there was it was like a fake Raffi. That was a hologram, and because on her shoulder she had a mo mobile emitter, you know, kind of like a little thing that. It's like mm -hmm. that, uh, and that is from Voyager. The uh, EMH doctor, played by Robert Picardo, ended up getting that in like an episode, and then it allowed him to go outside of sick bay. That was a, another good one. Um, mm. Okay, so that's great stuff there. Anyway, um, 
Any final thoughts before we get out of here and watch episode six as fast as we can? Um, yeah, no, not really. Um, wardrobe was also great too. Uh, I'm looking at Worf's. I knew you uh, would outfit behind <laughs> Me you. Too. Looks look looks great. I like the yeah. off centered kind of design. Um, on, on that note. I noticed that Rafi was wearing a shoulderless thing, which I thought was a really smart move because if anybody hasn't noticed, she's obviously in great shape and she has great deltoid muscles. So they mm -hmm. they showed that. And then there were a couple little shots where she does this or that that actually showed off a little bit of shoulder ripple, a little deltoid ripple. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, smart. I don't know if that was wardrobe directing, if that was uh, Michelle Hurd herself, but somebody was like, let's show a little deltoid rippling you've earned it you know so good on her for uh doing that that was pretty badass <laughs> michelle heard to wear a, a bed sheet or a potato sack and look make it look great she's just <laughs> yeah. an awesome person she's yeah. just just special like he's just built different so uh, but yeah i did notice uh the wardrobe as well also like i said the consistency of the lighting for those exterior shots when they're walking through the what i call blade runner city <laughs> uh, it, it it was it maintained its consistency so far and that's why i had questions for dan about you know how he navigates through those kinds of shots and mm -hmm. it seems like it's all it, it's just the fluidity of it is amazing um and terry metallis man the boy that boy good the boy good the guy that named boy, after the saying. planet yeah yeah the guy <laughs> named after metallis yeah. prime right yeah yeah that guy's pretty good well uh <clears throat> yeah loving it loving every second of it i'm sure there are more uh easter eggs and references out there that we've missed so please let us know in the comments below anything that we may have missed or any corrections uh because we're nothing if not responsible and honest so you let us know what corrections we need to issue next week um and please be sure to like this video if you're listening in uh, give us a five-star rating and a nice review and subscribe to this channel if you're watching on YouTube. We appreciate all of that. And please go visit us on patreon.com slash the seventh rule. If you like what you see and you want to support, help us keep the lights on. Help us keep that lighting that Sorak is so fond of. Uh, we appreciate <laughs> all of you. Um, and please be sure to share this video with all of your pals so they know what fun we're all having together. And while you do that, we're going to give a special thanks to a few of our pals. And their names are, in alphabetical order, Homer Frizzell, Dr. Anne-Marie Siegel, Eve England out in Wales, Yvette Blackman Tom, TJ Jackson Bay out in Missouri, Bill Victor Arukin, uh -huh, Arukin. Titus Muller, Darlena Marie, Dr. Muhammad Noor, Tierney C. Diekman, Anna Post, Anil O. Palat, Joe Balserati, Mike Gu, DQ, Neil Akasaka, Justine Akasaka. Norton Kurtzen, Dr. Stephanie Baker, Carrie Schwent, Faith Howell, Edward Foltz, my live from Tokyo, V. Matt Boardman, Chris McGee, Justin Weir, Jake Barrett, Jane Jorgensen, Henry Unger, Allison Leach Hyde, Jed Thompson, Luther Haynes Jr., Dr. Courtney Lewis. Beth Ernest, and of course, Dr. Susan V. Gruner and Jason Oaken. By the way, uh, that is alphabetical order in the Breen language. I forgot to mention the, the oh, Breen. Okay. Yes, yeah, the Breen. So obvious. Anyway, <laughs> thanks very much. Looking forward to episode six. And until next time, enjoy our wild America. Do you ever used to watch that? Marty Stauffer? It was like a no. nature show back in like the 80s and 90s. Somebody knows. Anyway, Marty Stauffer. Anyway, nope. good time. <laughs> <laughs> good time. <laughs> we'll see you next time. Until then, always remember the seventh rule.